Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the 9.15 a.m. service for St. Basil's R. Tarman. I'm Jonathan from the Mac Congregation, and it's great to have you along with us this morning. Last week, we looked at the second half of Romans chapter 5, which describes how sin has come into the world, but how grace has overcome sin. We looked at the similarities and differences between the old humanity of Adam and the new humanity in Jesus. This week, we are looking at Romans chapter 6. Today, David, our minister, will take us through this passage that shows how we were slaves to sin, but have been set free by Jesus to become slaves to righteousness. In our service today, we will sing a song together, then we'll have a message for the younger ones at Kids Spot, and you can download the activity sheets from the website. We'll then read the Bible and hear from David on today's passage. We'll read together a confession of our sins. We'll have a time of corporate prayer. And then we'll finish with announcements before joining together on Zoom. As we start our time together this morning, please join with me in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for creating us and this world that we live in. We give you glory for all that you have done and all that you have promised to do. We ask that you help us in our time together today, that we will learn how to better follow you. Amen. Hi kids, welcome back to another week of Kids Spot. You've been spending a lot of time at home over the last few months. Has anyone thought of what their future looks like? When can I go back to school? When can I see all my friends? When is the virus going to be over? Or maybe, when is lunchtime? Or have you thought of what you want to be when you grow up? Has anyone ever asked you this question? Does anyone here want to be a basketball player? You could be just like Justin. What about a scientist? You can be in labs mixing chemicals. An astronaut? You could go to space and discover things out of this earth. A mathematician? You can solve all kinds of equations. What about a teacher? 
You know what I want to be? A slave. Now, does that sound fun, kids? You're probably shaking your head right now thinking, who wants to be a slave? That must be the last thing you want to do. No money, no freedom. You have to follow orders from someone that doesn't pay you for the rest of your life. Well, you know, the Bible actually tells us to be slaves, but not these kinds of slaves, but slaves to righteousness. Now, what does this mean? I'll give a whole bag of lollies and five dollars to the first person who can tell me what this means. Ready? Three, two, one. Hands up. Oh, that's too bad. I guess I get to keep all the lollies to myself today. The Bible actually tells us that being a slave isn't too bad after all. It even leads us to heaven. There are two sides of this: being a slave to sin and being a slave to obedience. When we are slaves to sin and we fall into something called temptation, this is when we may get a moment of happiness, like a time you know you shouldn't be doing something, but you just wanted to do it. However, this moment of happiness eventually leads to an eternity of darkness. On the other side of things, if we are slaves to obedience, we follow God. We automatically receive the best gift, the gift of God, which is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Stated in Romans six, verse twenty-three. So, kids, it isn't too bad being slaves, especially to such a loving and kind master. Now, let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for showing us these strong messages in your Word as we continue to follow you day by day as slaves to righteousness. We also thank you that you have given us the best gift, which is Jesus Christ, your Son. We continue to pray that you may keep our faith strong, so that we may not show weakness and fall into the worldly traps and temptations that seem so great, but are so temporary. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Hello, everybody.、Um, uh, Mel, as some of you might know, is involved in the playgroup ministry、uh, at Trinity Chapel on Wednesday.、Uh, so I was just going to ask a few few questions about the ministry. Uh, so we, we can help her and pray for her as well.、Uh, firstly, Mel,、um, can you tell us a bit about、uh, who comes to this playgroup ministry、uh, that you run on Wednesday?、Um, so we have between fifteen to twenty families who turn up on any given Wednesday. They're mainly from the Indian subcontinent, so people from Pakistan, Sri Lanka, India. But we also get a few families from. Uh, Southeast Asia as well, like、uh, Vietnam, China, and Indonesia.、Um, the kids we're getting are mainly between zero to five years old. This this term we're getting all the very little ones,、um, so two to three year old. Wow!、Uh, and when they come,、uh, what sort of activities do you do with the children and the parents?、Um, so the playgroup runs over two hours. In the first hour, it's mainly free play with a lot of toys and craft and painting and so on. And the second hour, we have a reading and,、uh, and singing time where we teach them the gospel of the Bible, but in a kid-friendly way. And we sing a lot of Christian kids' songs as well. So you get all these many Muslim kids singing about Jesus. Yeah, a lot of Colin Buchanan songs. <laughs> okay.、Um, what sort of opportunities do you have for, in sort of、um, for relationship、uh, and for evangelism、uh, through play group? There's lots of opportunities each week because the playground does run over two hours, so there's just lots of time to have a chat with parents、uh, while watching the kids play.、Uh, a lot of parents come、uh, are from are either immigrants or expats here looking for work, so they really welcome the opportunity to、uh, speak to Australians, to practice their English, get acquainted with the Australian culture. Many of them are also regulars who come every week, so you can deepen the relationships quite easily over the weeks. And when they join, they join. They usually come for one to two years. Some even returning when they have a new baby. So you really do have a good chance to develop that relationship there. Yeah.、Um, uh, how about for evangelism?、Um, what sort of opportunities do you see?、Uh, for evangelism, the, a, a lot of families come do come from a Hindu background, but they are very willing to talk about religion, God, and to pray together. So at Mac Playgroup, we tell them outright that. We are a church-run playgroup, and we read Bible stories, we sing Christian songs, and we say grace every week. And we've never had a, a person with a problem with that. And 
over the t- over the one and a half years we've been able to share with them about how God created everything, um, the characters of God, how powerful He is, He's in control, He's loving, and just this term we've been learning that God, uh, it's uh, Jesus is God's promised Son sent to save us. So we've been learning about Jesus' power over all the creation, sickness, sin, and death. And just last week, we learned that he's a king over the whole world and we should all follow him. Wow. Wow. That's exciting. Makes me want to come. Um, uh, and since the COVID-19, uh, how has that changed uh, the playgroup ministry? COVID has, of course, put a stop to all our face-to-face activities. However, we have never really stopped uh, running playgroup apart from the first couple of weeks. Actually, since March, we've been doing playgroup uh, online, first with pre-recorded videos and we send them craft activities and songs to sing. And just this term, we've progressed to doing interactive playgroup on Zoom. So right now we meet for about 45 minutes each Wednesday and we play online games and we sing songs and we share Bible story with the kids and the parents. Uh, And what sort of way we can support you or what sort of help would you need? The biggest help right now is, um, is Christians who can help to run the playgroup either online or in person every week. We've been very fortunate to have Sherry uh, in the last two terms and my friend Varney and also Maggie from Trinity Chapel uh, who were helping out each week. Um, But both Sherry and Varney will be going off um, to have a baby soon and Maggie, she's slightly older, and so we'd be quite reluctant to ask her to help even when we return to playgroup um, unless there's a vaccine. Um, uh, and lastly, um, following that, what sort of things we can pray uh, for you and for the playgroup ministry? I think pray, ask God for workers who have a heart for this people group and for children's ministry, um, but also ask uh, God to help the children and parents who remember uh, everything that we've shared with them in the last uh, one and a half, two years and help uh, ask him to open their hearts and minds to him and want to learn more about him. Um, I'm, I'm excited. Um, so if anyone who's interested to help out, uh, please come talk to Mel or, uh, for, for t- or to me. Um, but before we end, uh, let me pray. Uh, let me pray for Mel, uh, for the helpers and for many evangelistic opportunities that we do have. Let me pray. Uh, and Father, we thank you uh, for the Ministry Play Group. We thank you for uh, Mel and many other volunteers like Sherry, Vana and Maggie, uh, who's been teaching and uh, running it. Uh, telling others about uh, Jesus. Um, We thank you for the relationship bridges that's been formed. Uh, We thank you for the gospel opportunity. Uh, We pray, Father, for your word uh, to take root in those hearts, uh, in the children's hearts, as well as the mothers and parents. Uh, They'll grow up uh, knowing that uh, you do love them, that you're in control and you're all-powerful. We pray, Father, for this gospel uh, ministry at the moment. uh, for more helpers, for not more help, uh, for parents uh, who see great evangelism opportunity to tell others about Jesus. Uh, we pray you do race workers, um, people who are willing to help um, in week-by-week basis. Uh, we thank you for Mel's ministry. Uh, we thank you for um, many people who helped in the past. Uh, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We'll now have the Bible reading from Romans chapter 6, starting at verse 1. After the Bible reading, David will bring us today's message. Romans chapter 6, starting at verse 1. What shall we say then? Are we to continue to sin in that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptised into Christ Jesus were baptised into his death? We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in the newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ has been raised from the dead and will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. 
For the death he died, he died to sin, once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal bodies to make you obey their passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourself to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are no longer under law, but under grace. What then? Are we to sin because we are not under law, but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed and have been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. I am speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. When you were slaves of sin, you were free in regards to righteousness. But what fruit were you getting at that time from the things of which you are now ashamed? The end of those things is death. But now you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God. The fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end, eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Good morning, our time in church. Uh, great to be here. Uh, my name is David. I'm the minister of this church. And we're looking at the book of Romans, Romans chapter 6. And let me pray as we look at God's word together. Heavenly Father, as we look at your word, we just pray that you do help us understand what you have achieved in Christ. Help us understand that we've died to sin. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. My two boys love a game of cricket, and a coach taught them how they should bat. There are a few steps to batting rightly. Firstly, you have to watch your stance and how you hold a bat. Secondly, you need to watch the ball and swing the bat. And thirdly, you need to observe the follow-through and the position of your elbows at the end. See, the follow-through is just as important as the stance and how you swing your bat. You would have thought that once you hit the ball, where the bat ends up, where your elbow is, is irrelevant. In fact, it's far too late. The balls are already on the way to the boundary. However, the follow-through and the position of your elbow tells you a lot about how you hit the ball and how hard you swung the bat. See, if your elbow is high after you hit the shot, it means that most likely you have hit the ball on the ground. If you follow throughs over your neck, it means that most likely you have hit the ball with enough force. Therefore, as you observe your follow through, it gives you information about how you have hit the ball. Therefore, as a batsman, you watch your follow through. That's true for many racket sports like golf or tennis. You watch where your racket or your club ends up. It gives you information about your shot. That's the same as when I do Christianity Explain. I always love the question people ask because the question gives me an idea whether they have understood what I said. The question gives me insight to the understanding. The questions are the follow-through, the follow-through questions. 
In the book of Romans, Paul has been just has been arguing that we've been justified by faith. We've been declared righteous by trusting in Jesus and Jesus alone. We have done no work. We have not earned it. Salvation come as a free gift from God. We blood on God. In fact, last week we saw that the more we sin, the more we will be forgiven. Where sin increase, grace increase all the more. It was a teaching that threw the whole world upside down. It caused a stir in the ancient world. Because for most of us, for many parts of the world, well, religion is about morality. We need to give people an incentive to do good. By preaching that salvation is a gift, or by preaching that forgiveness is for free, there's no incentive at all to do good. It just does not make sense. This teaching from Paul was totally opposite to what we expect. And many people have wondered whether this was what Paul was preaching. See, we can be sure, we can be sure that this was what Paul was preaching because of the follow-through questions. What would you expect people to say when Paul preached that justification is by faith? What would you expect people to ask if people say salvation is for free? See, we expect people to say, what is the point of doing good? Why don't we sin all the more? Friends, these were the questions that Paul was anticipating. Look at me, Romans. Romans chapter 6, verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? Of verse 15. What then? Shall we sin because we're not under law but under grace? See, they were the exact, exactly the follow through questions that you expect if Paul were preaching that justification is by faith. Therefore, we can be confident that we've been reading Paul rightly. This raises another question, however. Does that mean that Christianity promotes sin? If every sin that we've been committed will be forgiven, why don't we sin all the more? Do you see the conundrum? If this is true, what is the point of doing any good works? I can be as selfish or as greedy as I want, and I will be forgiven. It was interesting that the answer that Paul gave was not more laws. Instead, he pointed us to the reality of our status and our salvation. In our world, the solution to sin is always more laws. So when we see racism in the world, well, we pass anti-discrimination law. When we see people cheating in taxes, well, we pass more tax laws. We just pass more and more laws. In the end, we can't do anything or say anything less we offend somebody. The problem with law is this. It does not change the heart. Yes, it can modify our external behavior somewhat, but it does not change or affect how someone thinks or someone how, how they feel. We can just be as racist in our hearts. Law does not make us love another person more. So the Christian solution to sin in a love of believer is not more laws. But it goes back to our reality of our status in Christ. 
the solution appeals to the mind and to their knowledge of God. Look at verse 3. Or don't you know, verse 6, For we know, verse 9, for we know. See, friends, Christianity is not anti-knowledge. In fact, it appeals to the mind. It does not bypass the mind. It's important that we know the truth because the right knowledge will really lead to the right behavior. What are the knowledges that we ought to know? Firstly, we ought to know that we've been baptized into Christ. The baptism that we have symbolizes a union with Christ. In our baptism, we are united to Him. Christianity is not a new morality or new ethics or conduct we live by. Christianity, in the end, is a relationship and an allegiance to a person, the person Jesus Christ. We are united to him in a relationship. He is our Lord. Just as a wife is united to her husband in marriage, we are united to Christ. Just as the wife takes on the name of a husband, we take on the name of Christ. We are called Christian. Secondly, the baptism into Christ is a baptism to his death. And resurrection. Look at verse 3 to verse 5 again with me. Or don't you know that all of us who are baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We're therefore buried with him through baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. The baptism that we have is a baptism into his death and resurrection. Because we're united with Christ, what happens to him happens to us. That's true in our world too, doesn't it? When a husband has Australian citizenship, well, the wife automatically gets Australian citizenship. Or if the, the husband is the prince, well, the wife automatically becomes the princess. Christ has died and rose again, and therefore we too have died and rose again. We were baptized into his death and resurrection. Thirdly, the death of Christ was a death to sin, and his resurrection was a resurrection to God. Look at verse 6. Verse 10, verse 6 to verse 10. But we know that our old self was crucified with him, so that its body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin, because anyone who has died has been freed from sin. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. By the life he lives, he lives to God. See, so what does it mean? What does it mean the death he died? We die to sin. Firstly, I have to explain what it is not. Among the Christian circle, well, that, that's something called what we call the holiness movement. And they argue for something called sinless perfectionism. And what the, the way they explain it is this. Just as the dead person cannot no longer see, hear, smell, or touch. Therefore, by analogy, well, a dead person is unresponsive to the stimuli of sin. Just like a dog is, is unresponsive. A dead dog is unresponsive when he kick it. A person who has died to sin is, is unresponsive to sin. So according to J.B. Phillips, a dead person can be said to be immune to sin. 
Or C.J. Vaughan said, A dead person cannot sin. The sinful nature has been crucified according to them. Therefore, for them, it is possible for a Christian not to sin. A Christian person can reach such a holy state that they are no longer affected by sin. It has been called the holiness movement, and some have linked it to the second baptism or the second blessing. However, the the doctrine of sinless perfectionism has led many people to self-deception, to disillusionment, and even to despair. And exegetically, well, there are a few flaws. Remember, we die to sin just as Christ is dead to sin. When we say Christ is dead to sin, it cannot mean that he became unresponsive to it. Because it would imply somehow that Christ was formally responsive to sin. Could our Lord Jesus be alive to sin and then be subsequently subsequently then die to it? See, that is unthinkable. Furthermore, in verse 11, we are to consider, we are called to consider ourselves dead to sin. The only way we would consider ourselves dead to sin is if we are still sensitive to sin. If you are someone that's totally immune to sin, we do not need to consider, do we? We do not need to consider how we may be dead to sin. Do you see the few fatal flaws? So when Paul claimed that we have died to sin, it cannot mean somehow that we are unresponsive to sin or somehow we are now immune to sin. What does it mean then? What does it mean that Christ died to sin? It can only mean one thing. When Christ died to sin, He died to the penalty of sin. He paid the wages of sin. He bore our sin, suffered our consequences, and met the claim of justice. Sin, therefore, does not have any claim on him. Therefore, when we talk about that we have died died in Christ, it's talking about the fact that we in Christ have paid the penalty of sin. We have met the claim of justice on my sin. So it's not so much. It's not. I'm no longer sensitive to sin. But in Christ, I have paid the penalty for my sin. And because I paid the penalty for my sin, verse 6, the body of sin might be deprived of its power so that we should no longer be slave to sin. And verse 7 gives us the reason. Because those who died have been literally justified from sin. How is the body of sin deprived of its power? How is it that we're no longer slaves to sin? It's because we've been justified or freed from the penalty of sin. Sin and its penalty has no longer any hold on us. Just imagine, just imagine, that's a person called Mr. Jones. Mr. Jones. Mr. Jones is a criminal criminal and a murderer. He was caught by the police and he was charged. And he was sentenced to death for his crime. Once he has died, Well, he has paid the full demand from justice. Once he's died, well, he's freed from his crime. The police can no longer charge him after he has died. You can't condemn him when he's dead. Once he's dead, he has been freed from the law and from his crime. 
In the same way, in Christ we have died. We have met the full force of the law. And we paid for our crime to the full. As a result, we're not free from the penalty of sin. My old life's finished. The amazing news to Christianity is this. Just as I've died with Christ, I've also been raised with Christ to a new life. And this new life is different from the old. It has new identity. It has a new name, the name Christian. And in this new life, well, I'm free from the penalty of sin. In this new life, well, I've met the full force of justice. Do you see that? The reality for Christian is this. In Christ, we have died to the penalty of sin. And my past no longer has a hold on me. No, the Lord no longer has his charge against me. That's the reality we have as Christian. Fourthly, since we've died to sin, we must consider it so. Look at verse 17. Verse 11. In the same way, count yourself dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. The word count here is the word reckon. Our past life as a sinner has died in Christ. And therefore we must consider our past gone. It's not so much I we should I it's not so much I can no longer sin. It's by the fact that now it is inappropriate for us to do so. The, that's the past. It has died. One of the best way to illustrate is marriage. On a wedding day, while the groom leaves his bachelor life behind and take on the bride as his wife, the old bachelor life is gone. He's no longer a bachelor. From that day onwards, well, he must remind himself daily that he is now married because he's rightfully and lawfully married. This is not a make-believe. This is a reality. Is it possible for him to backslide to his old ways as a bachelor? Well, it is possible, but it is inconsistent with his current status. Instead, he must consciously remind himself daily that he has left his old life behind and now he is married to his wife. And he wakes up in the morning, remind himself, I'm now a married man. I'm now a married man. Friends, we have died to sin. We must consider that we have died to sin. And that is the reality. The sinful life, our sinful life in the past was no longer appropriate for us in our new status in our life as Christian. Our sinful life was the past. Fifthly, not only must we consider ourselves dead to sin, but we must act in that way. Look at verse 12 to 14. Therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer the parts of your body to sin as instruments of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer the parts of your body to him as instruments of righteousness. We no longer let our sin reign in a mortal body. We no longer offer ourselves as instrument of wickedness. Sin is no longer our master. Not only do we count ourselves dead to sin, but we do not give ourselves as instrument of wickedness. See, when we're tempted, tempted to sin, you should just say to yourself, well, that was my past life. I've died to sin. I no longer have to live that way anymore. 
I no longer have to be greedy like everybody else is greedy. I have a new life. I no longer have to be selfish like everybody else is selfish. Well, I have a new identity. Instead, we offer ourselves as instrument of righteousness. We offer ourselves in service to others. We offer ourselves to love others. This is our new life. From verse 15 to 23, Paul answered a question in a different way. We are slaves of someone. While we think ourselves as independent, well, we often, we always follow someone, don't we? We might follow the lure of money. We might follow the celebrity. We might even follow our own wish and our dreams. Well, we are always slaves of someone. We used to be slaves to sin. We give in to all sorts of sinful behavior. And the result of being slaves to sin, well, it is death. You see that in some of our friends, isn't it? They give themselves to all sorts of hedonism or drunkenness. Others give themselves completely to the pursuit of their career or money. Others blindly follow their cultures and tradition, whatever it might be. Others give themselves to their family and children. That was what we were. We were slaves to sin. Now we come to obey from our heart the pattern of teaching. We've been set free from being slaves to sin. We have now become slaves of righteousness. We give ourselves to righteousness. We give ourselves to all sorts of good deeds. That is who we are. And many times, friends, we get nothing out of it. But that's all right. We're always dedicated to do good. Many a times while we pursue righteousness, it's going to cost us our family, our lives, our money. But that's all right. That's who we are. We're slaves of righteousness. Many times we seem that we're losing out again and again and again, tired, frustrated, even let down. But that's all right. That's who we are. We're slaves of God. Do you see that? The reason we do good is not because of the law. The reason we serve is not because of what we call society expectation. The reason we do good is because this is who we are. We are dead to sin. Therefore, we put off all our sinful desires. We are slaves of righteousness. Therefore, we are someone who is committed to do good. We are driven to serve God and serve others. During the past few months, I've seen, I've seen the work of God in the lives of some people in church. While many turn to themselves for protection, self-preservation, they are willing to serve and serve others. For some people in church, well, they have every reason not to serve. They have elderly parents at home. Or there's sickness in the family. Or there are many problems they need to work through. But they don't want to put up the hand to serve others and to love others. Friends, that, that is the amazing work of God in their lives. I can't see any other reason why people would serve and give themselves in these times. As friends, as Christians, we are dedicated to do good. We are now slaves of righteousness. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, as we look at your word today, we remind ourselves that we are dead to sin. We 
Jesus has paid a penalty for my sin. And now we're free to do right. In fact, we are a slave of righteousness. Help us to know that. But more than that, help us to live that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please join me now in a time of confession. Heavenly Father, we praise you for adopting us as your children and making us heirs of eternal life in your Son, Jesus Christ, who has freed us from our sins by his blood. Yet we still fail to love you with all our heart or serve you as we ought. Pardon our offences, we pray, and make us clean that we might continue as members of Christ in whom alone is salvation. Amen. Raymond will now lead us in a time of corporate prayer. Good morning, everyone. Today we'll be praying for those affected by the pandemic and the lockdowns, for the continual outreach of the gospel message, and to also thank God for our new lives in Christ. Dear Heavenly Father, we ask for your mercy in our world today. We pray for those who have been physically and financially affected by the global lockdowns. And in particular, we ask for you to bring comfort and to restore order to the areas which have been the hardest hit, to the areas where many people have lost their jobs, to the areas where crime rates are surging and many families have to go hungry. We ask for your grace for the individuals and families who face an impossible task in these situations. And at, su and at such a time when we are so often reminded about death and how easily it can happen to any one of us, we want to thank you, Lord, for the hope of eternal life that we can have in Jesus. We thank you that through him you have freed us from the bondage of sins in the moment when Jesus first came into our hearts. We ask, Lord, that you will help us to put to death the ongoing sins in our life so that we can become instruments of righteousness to do the work in your kingdom. And we pray that the work in your kingdom may continue despite the pandemic and the lockdowns. We pray, Lord, that the gospel message can continue to be told throughout the world in the hardest to reach places. We do pray, Lord, that you'll raise up old men and women and missionaries to go to these places. We ask, Lord, for your providence to provide them with the resources so that people from every corner of the world will know of the hope they can have in Jesus Christ. And we also want to pray for ourselves living in Sydney. Help us to overcome the fear of man so that we can also be a witness to our friends and families and neighbours. And we want to pray for all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We now have a few announcements about things coming up. Firstly, after we finish our time here in the service today, we'll be joining together via Zoom. You can grab the details from the weekly email, and it's a great time for us to catch up with other people, to ask questions about Romans chapter 6, and to pray together. Uh, for toddlers, there'll be a time from 10.30am with a separate group, and you can get their details from their weekly email. If you have any comments or feedback or prayer requests, please jump on the church website and leave them there in the feedback section for us. We greatly appreciate your feedback and prayer requests. Our church has Bible studies during the week where we read the Bible together and pray together. If you'd like to join one of these, please contact David. We're also running a Christianity Explained course. If you're interested or have friends who are interested, please speak to David. There's a weekly prayer group on Wednesday at 10.30am for toddlers. Again, 
see the weekly email for more details. And lastly, the Church AGM is coming up on Sunday the 19th of July at 12.30pm. Please come and join us for this time as we work through some of the key administrative matters for our church. Before we end the time of service together and join together on Zoom, please join me now in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for providing Jesus and freeing us from our slavery to sin. We pray that with the help of the Holy Spirit, we will leave sin behind us. Help us to be fruitful in our lives under your hand as we look forward to eternal life with you. We ask these things in your Son Jesus' name. Amen.